Hello and welcome to the Habit Coach podcast. I am Ashtin Doctor, your Habit Coach, and today we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. And I think this is a topic that we all need to learn very well. It's about decluttering. You know, getting rid of all the stuff that we don't need. Why are we hoarding? Why are we collecting all these things? And we have an expert with us, Tracy McCubbin, who's going to be talking about you know decluttering and guide us through this process and. probably make it a habit. So Tracy, welcome to the Habit Coach podcast. Thank you, Ashton. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to talk to everybody. I have been waiting for this episode, <laughs> so I'm super stoked as well. Uh, Tracy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, absolutely. So, I'm born and raised in California in the United States. I had a funny background. I'm one of those people who did a lot of jobs to figure out what I didn't want to do. I was a personal assistant, I was a bookkeeper, I was I've been everything. And then when I was in my 40s, I started kind of helping people sort of sort through their stuff. I would help them go through their paperwork. I, they were moving. First I was doing it for free and not charging very much and then All of a sudden I joked my little flip phone back when we had flip phones started ringing and a friend of mine was like I think this is a business and I was like that's funny I just like doing this. So I decided I made a little website so this was in 2007 made a website put it out there. So I've been in business since then. I now have an 11 employees. We have a 6 week waiting list. We are constantly decluttering. So my company is called Declutterfly and we love it. We love what we do. So out of my work with my clients, I've written two books. My first book, Making Space Clutter Free, and then my second book, Make Space for Happiness, which is released on October 4th. Jessie, that must have been a strange conversation, right? Like will you come and get, help me get rid of stuff? Like how did someone even come up with that as a conversation with oh, you? Oh, that's such a great point, Ashton. So what happens for people is that all of a sudden their home stops working for them. All of a sudden they're like I'm not being efficient in my home. I'm not getting out the door in the morning to get dressed to go to work. I'm not eating healthy. All of a sudden all the positive things that they want to focus on in their life, they're not able to do because the stuff, the literal stuff is getting in the way. So I get a phone call like I'm really unhappy in my house or my kids and I are fighting all the time because it's always messy. I I need to get control of it. So It sort of came around another way and then everybody keeps saying, "Oh, I want to get organized. I want to be organized." Mm. But a lot of people don't understand that part of being organized is having a handle, having control of your stuff. It boils down to these emotional triggers. Exactly. Right? The reason decluttering's hard, right? The reason it's difficult for people is one, it's physical. It takes work. You've got to do it. It's a part of a chore. And one of the things that I like to tell people, which is why I'm so glad to be talking to you, is that you have to make decluttering a habit. You have to make a regular practice of it, like tidying up your house or, you know, doing your chores. You have to make a regular practice. But what people don't understand is that we are very very emotionally attached to our stuff. So, it's not just a matter of oh I'm going to throw this away. We're like, well, I paid really good money for this or my grandmother gave it to me or when my son was a baby, these were the shoes he wore. So, we put all this emotional stuff and all of a sudden these things in our house have all this meaning and they become these great giant things. and even though you don't use them you don't love them you don't need them we can't get rid of them because of this story that we've told this is so powerful in fact these excuses to not declutter i'm sure you must have heard every single one that exists every but before thing. coming to that, those excuses tracy i want to understand what is clutter how do you define clutter oh that's such a good question so One of the things that I tell people is I'm not a minimalist. That's a big buzzword. I'm not a minimalist. You know, mm. I have 10 books and 3, you know, that's not me. What I define clutter is is clutter is the stuff that gets in the way of what you want to be doing. So for example, let's say you want to start eating healthier. No more takeout, you know, no more fast food. You want to start cooking for yourself, but your kitchen is a disaster. You've got clutter all over it and you buy every new cooking gadget. You have a rice cooker and an Instapot and a, you know, all of a sudden your kitchen is so cluttered that you can't cook a healthy meal. So that's what it is. It's the stuff that gets in the way of the life you want to be living. That is so powerful. 
So if you want to be working out in your room and you have to clean up the room before you start working out, that is clutter. Exactly. Because think about it, Ashton. It's like, okay, I want to start working out. That's a fantastic goal. I want to make working out a habit. Fantastic. But if your room is full of clutter and you've got to move all the clutter away to work out, do you think you're going to work out? Right. So if that stuff is in the way, and you know, the great thing, that's a perfect example. We can do such good workouts for ourselves at home without any equipment. But if you've got to move the clothes out of the way and the kids' toys out of the way, you're less likely to do what's good for you. That's decluttering or figuring out your clutter have a lot to do with your prioritization, your goals, your intentions? Do you do all of that with your clients as well? I do. So the first place that I start with my clients is why? Why do you want to declutter? Does it matter? And this is not about, oh, you need to be a good housekeeper or your house needs to look pretty on Instagram. None of that. It's why do you, you know, for example, during the pandemic, I had so many people who are like, my mom needs to move back into the house because of this. Our guest room has just become a storage dump, you know, so I want to get it cleaned out so my mom can move in. I want to teach my kids good habits. Once you figure out your why, and it's a positive why, Ashton, it's not, I'm a bad housekeeper, I'm lazy. It's, these are the positive things I can bring into my life. So once you establish your why, then that's what's going to keep you motivated. That's so beautiful. And I love that you said that because whenever we talk about habit change, we also talk about that why, you know, the intention setting before you do anything is so critical. You know, otherwise it's just like, oh, we heard Tracy on Ashton's podcast and we're going to be decluttering. That's not, that's not going to be sustainable. No, and also I really believe, Ashton, that if your why is negative, you're not going to stick. You know, if you're not going to stick, like let's say you want to start working out if you and get healthy by working out. If you have a goal of like, you know, I got a really bad cholesterol report from my doctor. I want to stay alive because I want to see my grandchildren born. That's an amazing thing, you know, instead of you're just a bad person. So it's really for me, I want to get my clients and everybody out there to focus on the positive. Positive intention for whatever it is that you want to do. Exactly. You know, you spoke about minimalism and I have a hilarious story. So <laughs> when I redid my room outside, I decided I wanted to be like pristine and minimalistic, you know, just my TV, maybe my books, you know. And then suddenly, two years later, bam, <laughs> it's full of stuff, right? There's no place to sit. So it's interesting how clutter starts creeping in, right? How does that happen? So this is fantastic. So my new book, Make Space for Happiness, you know, everybody's been, we've been talking about decluttering probably for about 10 years now. But the thing that nobody's been talking about is where does the clutter come from? And so... The big news flash for everybody is that you bring the clutter in. We bring it in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we see something on sale. We, you know, oh, I'm going to read this book. So the new book, we talk about what I call clutter magnets. So there are these little holes inside of our emotional selves that we're trying to fill with stuff. You know, like, oh, I'm not feeling good about myself today. So if I buy a new blouse, I'll feel better or... You know, I don't feel like I'm very smart. So let me buy all these books and not read them. You know, so we're responsible for bringing the clutter in, which is fantastic because then that means we're responsible for living the life we want. We're responsible for creating the space we want. And I think a big thing, Ashton, that I always like people to start with is I think that around stuff, we use the word need nice. too much. You know, I need a new pair of jeans. I need, you know what? You don't. You really don't. We don't need as much. So I always tell people a fantastic, and everybody out there listening can start with this today. Instead of saying need around stuff, change the word to want. I want a new pair of jeans. I want a new motorcycle. You know, once you re acknowledge that it's a want and a desire and not an actual need, you get power over your purchase. That is so powerful, right? That one word, changing it, can make a difference on what you bring into your life. Do you need it? No, I don't necessarily need it, but I definitely want it. Right. right? If you want it, go for it. Right. Well, and also one of the other things I tell people for every, I don't know how it would translate in American dollars, I sort of say for every $50 purchase, wait 24 hours before you buy it. Ah, all right. So then 
do you really need it? You know, I'm in people's houses all the time and their kids have so many toys. So really today, that's an easy switch to make. Just start saying want instead of need. So something interesting happened the other day, all right? I'm, I went shopping to a mall after two and a half years. So I haven't been into a mall since God knows how long. <laughs> And I came out looking like Paris Hilton with six bags in each hand. <laughs> and I came home and I was like, damn, I don't have place in my cupboard. How am I going to put these in? Right. And and I was like, I'm, I'm going to talk to Tracy in a few days. I'm going to figure out what to do now. So now I have these brand new clothes that are there. What is it that I'm supposed to do next? So this is fantastic. I tell everybody for one new piece of clothing that goes in, one piece of clothing should go out. Right. And and our lives have changed a lot, right, in the last two and a half years. So are you getting dressed to go to the office anymore? Are you work from home more? Has your body changed? So I always tell people, as you bring in a bunch of new clothes, that's a perfect time to declutter. Go through your closet, do a fashion show, try it on. Do you like it? Do you feel good in it? Are you going to wear it? So that's a really good mindset, Ashton, is as you bring things in, You've got to, if you don't have room in your cupboards for the new clothes, then it's time to either return them or get rid of the stuff you don't wear. Okay, that's excellent. So basically fill up the same shopping bags with the clothes that you have and then give them away, <laughs> right? So you get the same equal amount going in and out. Exactly. And there's a great statistic for most of us. We wear 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. We wear such a small fraction of our clothes. So we, ha you know, we're buying because, oh, things are on sale and, oh, I, this looks so good. And one of the things I really want people to think about, and I talk about this in the book, Make Space for Happiness, is that one of the things about shopping, okay, this is important. We as humans are hunters and gatherers, right? Before we were industrialized, we would go out into the woods or into the farm and we'd find a pear tree or an apple tree. So when we would hunt that piece of fruit, we would get a hit of dopamine because we were being rewarded for finding food that was going to save us. Well, now that we're not hunters and gatherers anymore, and all you have to do is go to the corner shop to get what you need, we're still rewarded with dopamine, even though we didn't do anything spectacular to get that stuff. So what happens is when you're shopping, you get these little hits of dopamine. Oh, I feel better. Oh, I feel better. Oh, I feel better. But it goes away really quickly. So then you think that you need to do more shopping to get that dopamine again. So I want people to understand that there's something going on in your body when you shop, you know, that you get rewarded. I don't want them to mistake that dopamine for actually contentment or happiness. So Tracy, you were talking about dopamine right now. And I was listening to a podcast that you were on and you were talking about how clutter creates cortisol. And I found that very interesting as well. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So it's really amazing. I knew it from working with clients. You know, I'm a little bit cart before the horse. I was like, this is so interesting. My clients who live in very cluttered homes are really stressed out. So I started to research it and there is a direct correlation. The more clutter you have, the higher your cortisol. And interestingly, especially in women. So what happens is that we're living in this stressed out environment. We're stressed out already. We're raising children. We're going to work. We're doing, you know, all the things. And then we've got all this clutter. So our cortisol is super, super high. I read this study recently, and this was fascinating to me. So they took people and they put them in a uncluttered kitchen. So they put a participant in an uncluttered kitchen and they offered them a carrot and a cookie. And the majority of the people in the uncluttered kitchen took a carrot. Then they took people and they put them in a cluttered kitchen. They offered them the same carrot and cookie. And in the cluttered kitchen, most people took the cookie because there was some, there's something about the stress of the clutter makes you make bad decisions. Like, oh, I'll just have a cookie and another one and another one. You know, that it really, when you're trying to affect positive change and productive habits, the clutter is going to stop you. And then this is something very interesting too. And I don't know if you've talked about this on your podcast, Ashton, but have you talked about decision fatigue? Decision fatigue, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So, so important, yeah. So important. So think about decision fatigue in regards to clutter. Everything in your house is a decision you have to make. Do I have a home for it? Do I need it? 
Can I afford it? Did I spend money I shouldn't have spent? So when you have a house full of clutter, where should it live? Where should I store it? I don't have room in the cupboard. Every day, the more stuff you have, the more decisions you're adding on your plate. And because of that, when you get tired of making decisions, default to making bad decisions, not the healthiest decisions for you. So people don't realize all these different ways that clutter has an effect on your well-being. We're going to take a quick break. See you on the other side. Welcome back. All right, let's jump into the conversation. Interesting. So also, it's so interesting, right? Every time you see something, there's a memory attached to it. So you see it and that memory is being processed in at the back of your mind. And there's so much distraction taking place with just that. It's so much. And think about, you're a good example. So you went to the mall the other day for the first time in a couple of years and you came home with all these new clothes and you're like, I don't have room in the cupboard. What do I do? You automatically put yourself in decision fatigue. You'd already decided about yeah. all these clothes you were going to buy. And now you're home and you're like, I don't have room. I don't know what to do. And you just put the bags on the floor and you don't deal with it. Right. And then the memory part comes in. You start to go through your clothes and you're like, I remember this. I wore this on, you know, I met friends at a soccer game or, you know, all of a sudden you start to go. And what I want to tell people is that, and this is very important for people to understand that we don't want the stuff. We actually want the memories, but we've mistakenly Ooh. thought that the stuff is the memory. It's like the memories aren't going to go anywhere, you know, especially when it's things of people who have passed away. You know, we want to maintain that connection to our loved ones. And we think, oh, if I keep everything my grandmother ever touched, I won't have lost her. You know, and I, I invite people to say that you're trying to hold on to the connection, which you should, but the stuff isn't the connection. It isn't the connection. And one exercise I always have people do is think of your favorite person who's passed away. For me, it's my grandmother. I was so close to her. I would, she was my love. We were best friends. She's been gone about 20 years now. I was very lucky. She lived to 101. I had her for so many years. But I always think about if she, if I got her back for one day, let's say I got her back for one day. What would I want to do with her? Would I go to the mall and go shopping or would we talk about stuff? No, I know exactly what I'd do. We'd sit at her table. She'd make me a cup of tea. So we would talk. We would connect. If I saw her again, it wouldn't be about stuff. It would be asking her the questions I never got to ask her. So if you're really trapped with other people's stuff, you know, stuff from people who have passed away, I want you to think about if they came back, would it be about the stuff or would you just want to hug them again or take a walk or share a meal, you know, tell them what's been going on in your life? It's never about the stuff. So it's really important for people to think about it that way. Yeah, we're so scared of forgetting, right? We're so and scared we're so of forgetting. scared that if we don't have this, we'll forget about this incident that happened or this soccer game or that moment with your friends. And that's why your smartphone can be your friend. Take a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> in fact that was one of my questions you've done so much talk on decluttering your house but what about digital declutter right that is going to oh, be the next big thing it's right all, it's already the big thing i was i did a instagram live with a friend of mine who's a photo organizer and it was very very popular so, one sec what a photo organizer yeah so she comes and helps like she, like she helps people organize their yeah, photos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, it's amazing. Right. But we talked so much about digital photos because people have 10,000, 20,000 photos on their on their phones. And so one of the first things is, you know, I tell people when you can grab five, 10 minutes, start deleting photos. Because if you have 20,000 photos on your phone, and then when you actually start to look at them, I like to do it if I'm on a plane or a bus, you know, I'm sort of taking public transportation, I've got a little bit of time. All of a sudden you'll go like, there are 10 photos and they all look exactly the same and eight of them are bad. Delete, 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 you know, and emails are the other thing. I mean, everyone has, I don't know, 10,000 emails. To do that? You know, yeah. I'm a fan of folders. I create folders for projects, you know, back and forth and I move everything and that way, that way I have every email, it's already on Gmail, but I have it, but it's in a folder. I move it out of my inbox. Once it's dealt with, I move it out of my inbox. I think that's a fantastic way of dealing with the digital clutter and, you know, 
moving that out of your life. And then you can actually focus on the physical stuff that, that exists. Imagine how it feels though. Again, let's go back, Ashton, to decision fatigue. If you pop open your email and you have 50,000 unread emails, it's overwhelming you and you're going to start to shut down. So really think all of this stuff has an effect on you. It sneaks into your brain. Yeah. In fact, one of my podcasts was on how to unsubscribe from all the emails that you keep getting. So preventing clutter from coming in is a great way of not having to declutter later. So, you know, unsubscribing, make sure it doesn't enter. Exactly. And look, that you bring up such a great point. When people ask me, how do I get organized? What's the best way to be organized? Have less stuff. That makes it easy to be organized. It's simple. Less emails in your inbox. Unsubscribe. You're going to have less clutter. Have less stuff. Tracy, your first book was about making space, right? Like, what is making space? Can you define making space? Can you tell us why making space is important? Absolutely. So tagline of my company is make space for what matters. And I just love mm. that thought because it's, let's say you have a room in your house that is supposed to be the guest room and it's just full of everything, right? So you, by decluttering that room, you're going to either create a space, like if you have a family member who needs to come live with you, or you want guests to come and stay, or you want to make a meditation room. There's so much positive things you can do with empty space. And sometimes, Ashton, sometimes you just want empty space to be empty, right? Sometimes you just want a place where you're not being bombarded with images, you know, that you can sit and have a quiet moment, have a cup of tea. Like sometimes so many people, when I ask them their why for decluttering, I just want some peace. Ooh. Our family has this. If you, if you find an empty wall, we're going to put a picture. On it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like there is no empty space in our house. Empty space. Ooh, I know what can go there. One plant will miraculously appear in that place. That's such a good point, though. I want to say this, and we talked about this earlier. You know, it's different for everybody, right? Like if you're a family of six, you're going to have more stuff. I'm a family of two with my, you know, three right now. And so we have, it, it's what works for you. And so the trick is, is your home working for you? Does it work? Do you feel relaxed when you come home at night? Do you feel rested in the morning? Like you can only have X of X. Like, you know, some people, it's just different. And so I want people to understand that the litmus test is, is your home working for you? Is your home working for you? Creating that space, because also when you create space, you welcome in a different energy, right? Like you can welcome in something and change something in your life. Exactly. I'm using this opportunity of decluttering my wardrobe to change my energy in the way that I'm appearing in the world, right? So I think it's a great way of doing that and bringing about a change. So think about it this way, Ashton. Let's say that decluttering your wardrobe, that's a great point. Let's say, you know, I'm 57, gravity has affected my body. I can't wear the same clothes I could wear when I was in my 20s. It's just a fact of life. You know, I'm healthy, I work out, I'm in great shape, but my body has changed. If I kept a closet full of clothes from when I was 20, I would just feel bad about myself. I'd go in there and go, oh, you're a mm. failure. You don't look like you used to look. And energetically, that starts my day off. And, and also think about this in terms of energetically. If you have a home that you're not comfortable inviting people into, that affects you. You carry that around with you. You know, we are tribal. We are pack animals. We like our people around and we like to be connected. We learned this so much during the pandemic, right? We lost all our connections with people and everyone's depressed and anxiety. And so if your home, you can't welcome your people into it, that's going to affect you energetically. You're going to carry that around. You're going to be embarrassed. You're going to miss out on opportunities. It's really not about, oh, you need to have a pretty house to be a good housekeeper. I want your home where you can welcome people into it so you can connect. Interesting. In fact, my mom keeps saying that, Ashton, I'm so happy when you have a party and invite people to home. That's the only time you clean up. Right? So, <laughs> mom. So I think, yeah, that's absolutely. <laughs> you know, and look, it's a good reason. It's a great motivator. You know, I tell people, uh, there are, there are some things that are great motivators to, you know, change of the seasons. I always tell people do a big decluttering in change of the seasons because you want to welcome spring. You want to welcome summer, winter. 
that's a great reason. If you're having the holidays, you're having, you know, people over, that's a great motivator, you know, really to make decluttering part of your habit that it's not. And this is, I want to point this out because this is interesting. And a lot of people sort of combine the two, but there's a difference between decluttering, organizing, and tidying your house. This Ooh, is okay. great. This is really great. So tidy and cleaning your house, right? Mm. That's sweeping, that's mopping the floors, that's all that. That's We do that on a daily, weekly basis. Then there's organizing, mm-hmm. which is for you putting away your new clothes you got at the mall, making sure your books are right, you know, getting, putting things away. Everything has a home. But then there's decluttering. Decluttering is getting rid of the stuff you don't want, need, or use. So the order, I always think it goes decluttering first, then organizing, which is putting everything away, and then you can tidy and clean. And I think what happens for people, and this is important, is that they try and do all three at once. And it's too overwhelming. So break it up into tasks. Oh, Saturday, I'm going to declutter for an hour. Make an appointment with yourself. 10 to 11 in the morning, I'm going to declutter. Sunday, I'm going to do some organizing. You know, Sunday afternoon, I'm going to do some tidying. Breaks it down into manageable, doable chunks, as opposed to like, I got to declutter and organize and clean my house and then you don't do any of it. So would tidying happen at a more, at a higher frequency than organizing would be more and then decluttering would be yes. the least in, in that order? You wouldn't be decluttering no, every day, No, no, right? no, that's a great point. So cleaning and tidying is the highest frequency. I always tell people, if you can't, tidy up a room and get it back to the way that you're looking in 20 minutes or less, you need to do some decluttering. That's a really, if it takes you more than 20 minutes per room to organize and put things back, then the stuff has gotten the upper hand. So that's a good way for people to know, like, do I need to declutter? It's like, how long does it take you to put your house back together? And some rooms might need decluttering while some rooms might just need tidying. It's not that every room might have Exactly, cluttered. exactly. In fact, wanting to ask you this, what are some common mistakes that you find in different, different rooms? So if you can go room by room, like so in the living room, what are some mistakes that you see people making when it comes to cluttering? You know, I think in the living room, I see, um, especially if people have sort of a formal living room that you really just use for company or that, is that all of a sudden around the edges, people start to store stuff. You know, it's like, oh, we don't go in here very often. So I'll just put this bag and this will go over here. And I've got to return this to my auntie. So this will go over here. You know, that all of a sudden the living room becomes a storage depot. That's a really big thing that I see. You know, kids rooms. I actually think of all the rooms, Ashton, kids rooms need decluttering as much as they need organizing and tidying because toys It's like the grandparents bring toys and the aunts and uncles bring toys. And all of a sudden, you know, we know for personal development for kids that too many toys isn't good. Consumeristic. I want, I want, I want. So really, it's good to declutter kids' toys. Broken toys, you know, we just, it's a great, great place to start. So I definitely see that, you know, in the bedrooms and closets, keeping clothes we don't wear anymore, keeping clothes, you know, too many clothes and also, you know, things, things in the bedroom that don't support good sleep. You know, if you've got a bunch of exercise equipment in your bedroom and maybe you're not exercising or do you have, I see so many people in their bedrooms, like paperwork stacked up by the bed and on the floor. And I'm like, are you going to do your taxes in the middle of the night? What is all this paper? (laughs) So it's really understanding, you know, thinking about what, what purpose each room in your house your bedroom is to rest, right? So you want it to be a restful space. Your kitchen is to cook healthy food. Your dining table or breakfast room, you know, where you eat. Let's just say that your dinner table, the dining room table, wherever you eat meal, if that's covered with books and homework and bills to pay, you're going to end up eating on the couch in front of the TV. You know, you're not creating a space for you by yourself or you and your family to enjoy a delicious meal because also remember meal time is where we connect sharing breaking bread sharing food with us but if everybody's eating on the t- on the couch watching TV you're not connecting you're not ta- you know if everybody's on their phones while they're eat a you're not paying attention to what's going in your body it's like it's so easy to overeat and you're not connecting with your family members absolutely 
and this is so interesting right having that intention behind what that room is for we might have a room it might have just deteriorated into whatever it is now but imagine if you sat down and actually thought what you want that room to be or signify and then create that space declutter it accordingly i think it makes a beautiful home there exactly and it's intentional you know that you think I need a meditation space or I I've taken up painting. You know, I see this where people take up an art form and they buy all this stuff for it but they've never made the space for themselves to do it. So what's going to happen is you're just going to have all the stuff and you're not going to do it. So being intentional about your home is it's just a life changing for people. It's just life changing. Now if you like this podcast don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on social media. We are at IVM podcast on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to reach out to me, I am at Ashton Doc on Twitter and Instagram. We have a brand new habit coaching online course, quizzes, videos and a lot more on the website awesome180.com. So check it out now.